Let's talk now about your voice box. Um, the voice box is a really important and complicated structure in humans because for us, it's not just allowing us to breathe and swallow without things going down the wrong way. Uh, it also is important for speech and for singing. Uh, let's go over the parts of the larynx that you need to know uh, in the order that they're listed in your lab manual. So we're on page 31, we're in part B, and we're looking at the larynx models. And the first um, ana anatomical part you need to know is the hyoid bone. The hyoid bone is interesting because it's one of the few bones of the body that is not directly attached to another bone. The hyoid bone is attached um, to muscles up here at the bottom of your mouth, and then it's attached to muscles um, on the outside of your larynx. So it's not directly attached to another bone. The hyoid bone we'll talk about later because every time you swallow, uh, muscles that are attached from the hyoid bone to the outside of your voice box, every time you swallow, um, your voice box, your larynx, uh, goes upward, right? Goes up. And the reason it goes up is because every time you swallow, uh, the, high, the muscles, the extrinsic muscles of the larynx um, contract. And uh, since they're anchored to the hyoid bone, it, that pulls the larynx upward. The uh, larynx is made out of quite a number of cartilages. Um, we're asking you to learn the names of just three of those, the three largest ones. Let's start first with the epiglottic cartilage. The epiglottic cartilage, um, you can see this is what it looks like if you were looking at someone from the front. This is what it looks like from behind. And I think you get the best idea of what it does right here if you look at it from the side, this is a sagittal section. The epiglottic cartilage is the one closest to the top, so it's the most superior. And the epiglottic cartilage does this. So, um, yeah. So here's my epiglottic cartilage, and here is the rest of my here's the rest of my uh, larynx. Every time you swallow, the uh, muscles. Uh, uh, that are attached to the outside of the larynx, they contract and that pulls this whole thing upward. And as it pulls everything upward, it allows the epiglottis and the epiglottis, epiglottic cartilage is inside of the epiglottis. It, it allows the epiglottis to cover the opening to your windpipe so things don't go down the wrong way while you're swallowing. And then when you go back to breathing, everything drops back down and uh, and you're back to breathing in and out. The epiglottic cartilage really uh, controls whether things can go down the wrong way. It's not the last line of defense. The last line of defense is, is a different spot, but it's the most important line of defense. So that is the epiglottic cartilage. Let's talk about the thyroid cartilage. The thyroid cartilage is right here, and you'll notice it's called thyroid, and this gland that sits right here is the thyroid gland. So. There you go. The thyroid cartilage is the most, is the largest cartilage of the larynx. And thyroid, I think it means shield um, because it looked to someone like a, like a Roman shield. So that's the thyroid cartilage. What about the cricoid cartilage? The cricoid cartilage connects the larynx to the trachea. So all of this is larynx. The cartilage that connects the larynx to the trachea is going to be the cricoid cartilage. And the cricoid cartilage is a complete circle, um, kind of re resembles a class ring, um, and it goes all the way around. So you can see it is visible in the front, but if you look at the back, it's even bigger from behind. But look at all of those other cartilage there. There are a lot of them. Let's talk a little bit about the true vocal cords and the false vocal cords and the glottis. The glottis is the space through the larynx. So the epiglottis protects the opening to the larynx and the opening of the larynx goes into the glottis. What you'll find in the glottis are a couple of folds of tissue. The superior fold of tissue is called the vestibular fold, the vestibular fold. Um, and the vestibular fold also has the name false vocal cord, the false vocal cord. 
because it looks like a vocal cord, but it ain't what you're using to make noise, right? And immediately inferior to the vestibular fold is your vocal cord. That's also sometimes called the vocal fold, right? So false, false vocal cords, true vocal cords, those can also be called vocal folds. Um, so there you go. Now, the trachea, this is just the very beginning part of the trachea. The trachea starts here and goes all the way down. And one thing I would like you to know for the exam is that the trachea is made out of rings of cartilage that are shaped like the letter C. They're shaped like the letter C. The closed part of the letter is in front. The open part of the letter C is pointed towards the back. When, you know, in like an action movie, sometimes some uh, the hero finds someone that's got something stuck in their throat and they can't breathe. So they will uh, cut the throat with a knife and save their lives. Um, that procedure is called a tracheostomy because it's an opening, an ostomy in the trachea. And if your action hero did that properly, he cut from right to left in between the pieces of cartilage because cartilage doesn't heal well. So unless he wanted to be charged with hero malpractice, he has to cut from left to right. And then anything that opens that area up will allow the patient to breathe again. Tracheal rings, also known as cartilaginous rings. What else? Oh, I wanted to show you this. This is our lab model. And I wanted you to see it right up next to this particular diagram. So here we see the entire sagittal section of head. Here is just uh, the sagittal section of our lab model. This whole structure is called the epiglottis. Inside the epiglottis is number 23, the epiglottic cartilage. You're not imagining that. Those numbers are backwards because I had to turn it around to make it, to make it match. Uh, so this is the epiglottis, or, and that piece of blue is the epiglottic cartilage. Here we see the superior fold is called the false vocal fold, or the uh, vestibular fold, and the lower one is the true vocal cord, or I guess you could just call it the vocal cord. All right. So the epiglottic covers the glottis to prevent food from entering the larynx while you're swallowing. The interior wall's got two folds, the vestibular folds. The vestibular folds, they are the second line of defense. If any food or drink gets past your epiglottis, it's supposed to be caught by the vestibular folds. It's, it's the backup for protecting uh, of the glottis. And your vocal cords, they produce sounds. The intrinsic muscles are muscles inside all of that complicated uh, larynx structure. They're not really depicted on your lab model. Um, and their job is to control the vestibular folds and to tighten or loosen the vocal cords to change or lower uh, the pitch of your voice. Uh, the extrinsic muscles are the ones on the outside of the larynx and um, they uh, allow uh, the larynx to go upward when you swallow so that what you swallow does not go down through your larynx. Oh, and here's the vocal cords. Yeah, they're very cool. All righty, let's take a little look at the bronchial tree. The bronchial tree starts here at the trachea. We'll talk a little bit more about it in lecture. It branches right here at a place called the carina. And after the carina, you've got primary vocal, primary bronchi, and then the next time there's a branching, those are the secondary bronchi. And the third time they branch, that's the tertiary bronchi. I think you just have to know uh, the primary and secondary bronchi here. You also should know that the lungs are divided up into what are known as lung lobes. So it's almost like the right side of your chest has three little lungs. Uh, and the left side has got two little lungs. They're not little lungs, they're lung lobes. And they're cleverly called the superior lobe on the right side, the middle lobe, and the inferior lobe. And on the left side, you only have two lobes, the superior lobe and the inferior lobe. Uh, the 
sometimes you'll get a question like, why does the left lung only have two lobes and the left lung only has two lobes? The answer they want you to give is because it needed to make room for the heart. And it's true that the heart does occupy more territory on the left side of the chest. But honestly, they could have made three lung lobes and just made them smaller, but they didn't, not in humans anyway. This is really, really important. And I'd like you to know this. This muscle that separates the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity, that your stomach would be right here, your liver would be right here. This band of muscle is called the diaphragm. And without a diaphragm, you can't breathe, okay? If I paralyze your diaphragm, you might be able to keep yourself alive for a while, but not for days, okay? You need your diaphragm if you're going to breathe. So we go trachea, carina, primary bronchi, secondary bronchi, tertiary bronchi. Then we go to the bronchioles. The bronchioles. We'll get back to that. We'll get oh, primary, secondary, tertiary. We'll get down to the bronchioles. Now, the bronchioles are super small. The bronchioles uh, are different from any of the bronchi because they have no cartilage in them. No cartilage in them. Uh, right now, just memorize that, but when we get to the lecture part of the respiratory system, the part we used to do in the lecture hall, um, then uh, you'll need to know why that is so important. Uh, these end bronchioles, they're actually very, very thin. They've got a layer of smooth muscle around them. When the smooth muscle constricts, these tubes get very, very narrow, and it can be difficult for you to breathe when the tubes have gotten very, very narrow. But they end in little air sacs that are known as alveoli. The alveoli are all of these things. That is an alveolus. That is an alveolus. That is an alveolus. Everything that is kind of a light blue on this picture, there's an alveolus. That would be an area where only air should be. And I'm putting the laser pointer right in the center of an alveolus. The alveolus are the little air sacs. That's where the capillaries are that allow your blood and your lovely red blood cells to pick up the oxygen they need so they can carry it to all of the tissues of your body. Now we've got a depiction of alveoli, and you can see that the, each alveolus, there's one, there's one, there's one. They're in bigger bunches, almost like a bunch of grapes held together, and the whole bunch of the little alveoli would be called an alveolar sac. Um, that is where the actual exchange of CO2 and oxygen take place. Here is blood coming from a pulmonary artery, right? Because blood in the pulmonary artery is blue, meaning it is low in oxygen and high in CO2. And it is going to go through the capillary beds of the alveoli. And as it does, it will drop off the CO2, that's the trash, remember, and pick up oxygen. And as it leaves, it is filled with oxygen and it's beautiful, bright red blood. And that is why blood in the pulmonary veins is red instead of being blue. All right. I want to remind you that whenever you're looking at the anatomy of the lungs, please remember that the pulmonary artery, it's not just blue when it leaves the heart. All of these blue blood vessels, all of them are pulmonary arteries, right? And the pulmonary veins, they're not red just where they meet up with the heart. They are red the whole way through. So all of these red blood vessels are pulmonary veins. You know that's gonna be on the lab final, right? Okay, as long as we're clear. We'll pick this up at the next video.